Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous videos, we looked at the mechanism of the thoracic diaphragm, or we usually just call it the diaphragm, and how whenever the diaphragm contracts, it allows air to enter the lungs. And that, of course, is the process called inhalation, and then, of course, relaxation of the diaphragm, with possibility of other muscles, is exhalation, or we can call that inspiration and expiration. And then we also looked at the passageway of air through the respiratory tree. This picture is, is of course specific to inhalation and we would just reverse it for exhalation. But then once we get air into the alveolus, or alveoli plural, how do we then have gas exchange? In other words, how do we get gases such as oxygen and CO2 to move between the alveolus and the pulmonary capillaries, which are pretty much in this region right here surrounding the alveolus? Okay, How does that occur? We're going to discuss that in this video. But first, let's backtrack and take a little look at the heart. So let's look at this right here. So remember that blood from the general systemic circulation is returned to the heart through uh, certain vessels like the superior and inferior vena cava, but then it's going to be returned to the right atrium. And then from there, it's going to go to the right ventricle. But from the right ventricle, we enter the pulmonary circulation where that blood is pumped to the lungs um, for the purpose of picking up oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. And that's important to understand because all this blood that's returning to the right atrium, whether it's from the top of the body, from the superior vena cava, or the bottom of the body, the inferior vena cava, or even the coronary sinus from the heart myocardium, that blood is deoxygenated. The reason it's deoxygenated is because it's delivered all that oxygen to tissues. The tissues have picked up that oxygen. However, that blood is also high with carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide or CO2 is a waste product from the tissues, whether it be the heart muscle itself or muscles and tissues in the top or bottom of the body. So any blood that's going to the lungs to pick up oxygen is low in oxygen. It doesn't have zero oxygen. It just has only a little bit. And then it's loaded with carbon dioxide. And so right before that blood gets to one of the alveoli, it's going to be in what we call a pulmonary arterial. Okay? And the pulmonary arterial is going to divide many times, and we're going to get pulmonary capillaries, which are just in this region surrounding the alveolus. Pulmonary capillary. Okay? The pulmonary capillary is the site of gas exchange with the alveolus. Okay? And then, once gas exchange occurs, blood continues through the pulmonary venule, Okay, and that returns it to the left side of the heart. Okay, so sandwiched in between the pulmonary arterial and the pulmonary venule, we have the pulmonary capillaries, which exchange gases with the alveolus. Okay, now the key here to understand the directions of gas exchange is really to understand the partial pressures and also to understand one important rule. Gas effuses from high pressure to low pressure. That's very important to understand. Just like diffusion, we say particles move from high concentration to low concentration, in the same way gases diffuse down their partial pressure gradient. In other words, they diffuse from high partial pressure to low partial pressure. And you might have noticed I used the term diffuse. That's a common misnomer. It's not actually diffusion, it's actually effusion. Um, effusion is actually the movement of gases, okay? But sometimes those words are used interchangeably. So let's look at the partial pressures of the two major gases inside the alveolus. Okay? Now, these numbers right here, that is partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure, pressure of carbon dioxide, these numbers can actually change a little bit. These are really just rough estimates that on average are true. Okay? Um, it depends on whether or not you're talking about inspired air or the air you're about to expire. Okay? Depends on what you're talking about. But these are good numbers, and they'll illustrate for us the direction that gas is going to move. Let's first look at oxygen. The PO2, or partial pressure of oxygen, in the alveolus is around 140. Okay? Or on the arterial side of the capillaries, the PO2 is about 40. Okay, so what do you notice? 140 in the alveolus, and in the capillaries it's around 40. 
So that clearly says to me that oxygen is going to move from the alveolus into the capillaries, into the blood. Why? Because the pressure of oxygen is higher in the alveolus and lower in the blood. And gas is always going to effuse, or defuse, from high pressure to low pressure, from 140 to 40. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So in this case, oxygen is going to move from the alveolus into the blood. Now we can look at the same thing for carbon dioxide. What's the PCO2 inside the alveolus? That is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And we see that inside the alveolus, the partial pressure of CO2 is about 40. Okay. We look in the pulmonary capillaries, the PCO2 is 46. So the discrepancy is not as pronounced with CO2, but what we notice is that the PCO2 is higher in the blood. It's higher in the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. So that being said, CO2 is going to effuse from the pulmonary capillaries right here into the alveolus. Okay. Now, based on basic physiology, and probably what you've talked about before you got, ever got to the respiratory system, you probably could have guessed the movement. right? You could have guessed that oxygen moves from the alveolus to the blood, and CO2 moves from the blood to the alveolus. Why could you have guessed that? Well, we always know we're inhaling to take up oxygen, get oxygen into the blood, so we've got to somehow get oxygen from the lungs into the blood. Okay? But again, the reason, the physical reason why that occurs is because the PO2 is higher in the alveolus and lower in the pulmonary capillaries. And so for that reason, oxygen effuses or diffuses from high pressure to low pressure. And again, with CO2, you could have guessed that also. CO2 is produced by all the tissues of your body. It's a waste product, and we have to eliminate it. So it would have to go from the blood into the alveolus, right? But again, the physical reason for that, why it moves in that direction, is because the PCO2 is higher in the pulmonary capillary and it's lower in the alveolus, and it moves from high pressure to low pressure, and so therefore CO2 moves from the blood into the alveolus. Okay. So with this, we're really just looking at simple gases. Um, when we think about expiration or exhalation, same thing, um, we're exhaling, we're getting rid of air, but since we now have all this CO2 in the alveolus, that's going to allow us to expirate that CO2, and then it will go into the atmosphere. In contrast, with inspiration, we're taking in air, but we're really thinking about taking in oxygen. And so then the oxygen from the air that's in the alveolus will move from the alveolus into the pulmonary capillaries. Now, the blood flow here is in one direction. It goes at least the way I've drawn it, from left to right. We go from the pulmonary arterial to the pulmonary capillaries, which I haven't labeled here, and then to the pulmonary venule, which is now oxygenated, and it has had its carbon dioxide mostly removed. Okay? Again, it still has some carbon dioxide, but it's less carbon dioxide than it was before that CO2 diffused into the alveolus. And then this blood is going to return to the left side of the heart, go to the left atrium, left ventricle, and so on and so forth to the systemic circulation. And this process will repeat over and over again. But what I want you to notice is this. If we compare these values, PO2 and PCO2 at the pulmonary capillaries, pretty much before exchange occurs, to the contents of the pulmonary venule, which ends up being the contents of the arterial blood, Notice that CO2 really didn't drop all that much. It just goes from about 46 down to 40. However, if we look at the oxygen, it spikes up. The PO2 in the pulmonary capillaries before gas exchange is about 40, but in the arterial blood, before it really delivers any to tissues, it's going to be about 100, which is a jump of about 60. Okay? So, Hopefully this makes sense to you, at least the directions of this gas exchange. There's one other thing I want to cover in here, and that's actually what allows for this gas exchange to occur. So up here, this light pink area, this is going to be the lumen of the alveolus. Okay? Down here is, of course, the blood. We've got the pulmonary capillary right here, which is going to be the site of gas exchange. Okay? Now, Obviously, blood vessels, capillaries, they are thin-walled blood vessels, and they're lined by simple squamous epithelial cells. Okay? So here is some simple squamous cells right here. Also recall that the alveoli, or the alveolus, one in this case, is also lined by 
simple squamous epithelial cells. And being a simple squamous cell, if you're that type of cell, you're very thin. And so if a gas had to move across you, it doesn't have to move very far. That is a very low distance. Okay, And so because capillaries, that is these pulmonary capillaries, have simple squamous epithelial cells lining them, and because the alveoli also has the same tissue type, that's perfect for rapid and efficient gas exchange. Because if you had, let's say, cuboidal or columnar cells that made this up, gas exchange would be too slow. So having these two layers of simple squamous epithelial cells, one on the blood side, one on the alveolar side, that makes gas exchange super efficient. And so here we have a summary of this, oxygen moving from the alveolar space here into the pulmonary capillary, but then CO2 moving from the pulmonary capillary into the alveolar space. Okay, so we see that these gases move in opposite directions, of course. And again, these two membranes right here are so thin that they allow this gas exchange to take place efficiently and rapidly. And collectively, these two membranes are what we call the respiratory membrane. So when you look up the simple squamous cells that make up the walls of the capillary and the simple squamous cells that make up the wall of the alveolus, those collectively are called the respiratory membrane. And it gets this special name because there's not too often where we have two simple squamous epithelial layers in close proximity, in close juxtaposition to one another. And because you have the setup, form follows function, thin cells, even though it's two layers, very efficient gas exchange, okay? And also, these cells, so let's say this cell, and also, one more thing, these simple squamous cells that make up the lining of the alveoli, Okay? Not the capillary cells, just the simple squamous cells that make up the alveolus. These have a special name. They're called type 1 alveolar cells. Okay? Now, why is it type 1? Because there's also a type 2 alveolar cell that has a completely different function that we're going to talk about in the next video. Okay? But for now, understand that these cells that actually participate in gas exchange because they're so thin, simple squamous, those ones that belong to the alveolus are called type 1 alveolar cells, and collectively those cells with the simple squamous lining of the capillaries make up the respiratory membrane. So hopefully this concept of the respiratory membrane and the differences in partial pressures of these gases help you understand how gas exchange actually occurs at the molecular level. Okay. In the next video, we're going to discuss the function of the type 2 alveolar cells. We'll actually find it's a lot more straightforward and simple. Okay. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.